good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to all my colleagues from all over the world. Uh, I would like to welcome you today with this uh, web-based education from ADEC Dubai. Uh, of course, a special thanks goes to all the ADEC Dubai uh, staff. Start up with Dr. Abdul Salam Al Madani, all the scientific committee, the international advisory board, and all you know the stuff that was involved in launching this web-based education, uh, mainly in sharing knowledge and science within this very hard pandemic time. Uh, anyway, we we'll start today with uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Paul Nahas that he will be sharing with us his expertise in predicting and solving failure in posterior composite restorations. It's a pleasure for me to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Nahas, from the Lebanese University. It means which is strange, it's been two months I didn't see him, and he is 20, 30 minutes away from me. So he obtained his uh, DDS from the Lebanese University. His postgraduate in prosthodontics uh, studies were done in France at Claude Bernard Lyon. And he received a doctorate also in odontological science from the Lebanese University. He is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Aesthetic and Restorative Dentistry at the same university. And you can trust me, he is one of the finest clinician, and very knowledgeable educator. It's a, it's a big pleasure, Dr. Nahas, to, to have you uh, today uh, with us. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot see you. Uh, let's hope that you are staying safe at home and that you are finding enough time for being uh, productive. Uh, and let's hope that we can go back uh, to our clinic as soon as possible and to our normal life. Uh, as you can see from my um, uh, title, uh, we're trying, we will be discussing a little bit uh, about uh, failures in uh, uh, posterior composite restorations. And the most important part of it is to uh, try to predict the problem in a way to solve it. Because if we uh, try to uh, go back to uh, Einstein, what he was saying a long time ago, he said that if you, are, if you have enough time to uh, uh, check for your problem or to solve a certain problem, you need almost 99% of your time checking the reason behind your problem. After this, you can solve it within five minutes. And that's why it's always like this, even for posterior composite restorations. If you wanna solve a problem in your uh, daily clinical uh, practice, you have to look behind uh, this problem, I mean, you have to check for the reason for this. And to check for the reason for this, you have to know how to observe your problem. But observing a problem doesn't mean that you will get the reason behind your problem directly. You have to have a certain knowledge about this uh, entity of, let's say, the material, let's say, the techniques and everything. And from this uh, three elements, observing, having the knowledge, you might understand the reason behind your problem and thus you can maybe solve your problem. Of course, you have to plan for your treatment and the best way to plan for a treatment is uh, doing an, what we call an etiological treatment. Let me just try to simplify things for you. Let's go for clinical status. For example, if you have composite as for amalgam restorations, I will get my pointer here. So maybe we can, okay. And you can see this is a combination of two restorations, amalgam as well as composite. And both of them are almost uh, have a marginal deterioration. So you have to look for example, for marginal deterioration or maybe you have problems with the discoloration of these margins. Maybe the surface of the composite is not well polished. So you have discoloration of the surface of your composites or a, we have a lot of situations that might cause some failure in the eye of the patient as well as in the eye of the uh, practitioner. 
If you look also on your right side, the picture, you can see that this is a simple uh, preparation, yet you have the mesolingual cusp is so thin, so it might break. And these situations should be predicted before you restore in a way that you can uh, have a restoration that would last for a longer time. Again, if most of the problems that occur, sometimes you do your restoration, everything is okay. And after a certain time, you, have, uh, you lose your contact point. This is not because of your work, of course. It might be because of the patient. There is some kind of a mobility in the tooth. So you can see these situations are somehow uh, catastrophic because there will be some retention of food and you will have some recurrent decay. And these are situations that we are facing all the time in our clinics. Also, after, being, after doing a certain restoration, you will see Sometimes you cannot see them, but you have to check for them. And I have to know how to observe your teeth after your restoration. Look at this failure at the bottom, at the cervical margin of the cusp. So most probably the cusp was so thin, and this is what you might have at the end of your restoration. And trust me, within months, you will lose the cusp of this premolar. Modification of the color of the composite. You have to have the knowledge of the material that you are working with. And if you are changing from one material to another, ask the company the whole details about your material, whether it is a nano hybrid, whether it is a nano filled hybrid, whether, whether it is a micro hybrid and whatever the particles, whatever the materials, what you have inside your, uh, your composite. So you will know that after certain years, whether it will change the color of its color or not. These are situations that we can uh, face every day, especially in our days with the stress of the patients. You can see that there are a lot of patients that have hard, uh, heavy bruxisms. And you can see from the photos that the patient have already destroyed a very big part of his premolars and molars. I don't want to talk about the interior teeth because even it's worse in the interior region, but in the posterior region, you can see these situations are very difficult to restore. Yet, the tooth is still vital. And whether you go for a total restoration or a composite restoration, it's up to you to decide. But to know how to treat your patient, I will just to, uh, within the, this presentation, will try to find the elements that will guide you through whether you go for a composite restoration or whether you go for a full restoration. And in this way, you can predict in a way or another the failure of a certain type of a restoration on such teeth. The same bruxism might create some like abfraction or a, a destruction of the enamel and dentin on the cervical margins, which might create some hypersensitivity sometimes, or maybe some uh, decay because of food retention. And obviously, it's not uh, aesthetically, it's not acceptable by the patient. Yet, you have to look again at the pathologies whether your patient have a problem at the enamel layer or even the enamelodentinal layer, so you have some kind of uh, 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 difficulty to bond to such surfaces. And so whatever you do, uh, you know that composite is more uh, uh, bonded uh, to surfaces and we are uh, uh, lying on the laying on the uh, efficiency of our bonding. So if the surface that is supporting your restoration is not accepting in a way or another, uh, your uh, bonding is not uh, helping to infiltrate our bonding in their structure, we might lose our bonded restorations. Uh, also in the posterior region, the same that we have maybe uh, enamel uh, uh, amylogenesis imperfecta or even dentinogenesis imperfecta. More uh, cases like these, uh, you have to think about whether you go for uh, composite restorations, uh, the patient hygiene, is it acceptable in a way that your uh, uh, restoration would last? Uh, even if you are an excellent practitioner, I don't know if the patient will uh, uh, help you in keeping such uh, 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 bonded restoration on such in, in, in a case like this. So just simplifying things. And at the end, before I can jump to uh, the categorization of all of these uh, uh, failures, 
we might have also some debonded inlays in the posterior regions. Uh, if you look at the uh, left side, you can see that the type of a dentin uh, of this molar, it looks like if it is uh, 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 hypermineralized, so I suppose that uh, the bonding was not that efficient. And you can see from the uh, inlay, the internal part of the inlay has almost all the bonding cement on it, while on the tooth, you have almost nothing left from the bonded uh, from the cement, which means that the, problems, the problem was on the type of a dentin that you were facing. Yet, if you look in the boxes also, there are less enamel, which is one of the major elements that we will be talking about in this lecture. So we are facing some problems all the time in our clinics. Let's try to simplify them in a small table. Looking at some marginal deterioration, as we were uh, saying, fractures in the tooth, the contact points could be a problem for us. Even when restoring, if there is no adjacent tooth, how can we predict or how can we be sure that we don't have any uh, saliva or humidity that is infiltrating underneath our matrix? And then we have, in case of a problem in our composite, uh, hypersensitivity or post-operative sensitivity. We'll check about it and we need to try to know the cause and uh, the reason behind it. Also, we will try to check about different type of dentin, why and how to solve the problem facing uh, in front of a sclerotic dentin or tertiary dentin. Of course, we will discuss, but uh, very fast, uh, about pulp protection and the biological space, which is a major element in our uh, uh, direct restorations. The rest could be uh, problems that we are facing also air bubbles inside our composite, light curing unit, is it efficient or not? White lines uh, around the marginal uh, uh, restoration, the longevity of our composite uh, facing our MMPs that comes out from the pulp, all of these are factors that might affect. Unfortunately, within the 45 minutes, I might stop at the biological space. And if you like to discuss within the question, the other reasons we may open if, you, if the moderator of Dr. Ziad will accept. So if I want to categorize a little bit these problems, there are some problems that comes from the preparation, others that comes from the restoration by itself, and of course, others come from the patient. So your preparation is very important. Most of the time, we are concentrating on the material and the technique but yet the starting point is very important, which is the preparation. You have to know how to prepare your margins. And this is the closing uh, gates of your, uh, of your restoration. If you close well your restoration all around the margin, then you are in a safe, on the safe side. And then of course, you have to understand your material and you have to educate your patient, give him some uh, knowledge around uh, the concept of our uh, what, what we are doing for him and what he should do for himself to keep and uh, make these restoration last uh, as long as possible. Let's start with the first problem that we are facing. Most of the time, after a certain after a certain period of uh, time, let's say uh, two three years. Uh, almost all the time, this is around two to three years in some of the restorations, we can see a marginal discoloration. And if you look in the microscope, uh, you can see that these margins discoloration are caused by marginal dis, uh, uh, fractures, small fractures, or maybe a, a small deterioration, whether in the enamel side or in the composite side. Most of the time it is because of the enamel side. Also, we might face some fractures on the margins uh, because of a thin uh, margin that we have kept. But if you look deeply on a scanning electron microscope, most of the time when we cut our uh, enamel, we cut it in a way that the rods, the rods that you can see here, these are the rods of the enamels. We cut them longitudinally to our preparation. So the composite that comes and bond to these rods is bonding laterally to these rods. And if you look in almost all the literature uh, reviews, you can see that this image is not, is not uh, common. Most of the time you will see uh, images where you have the uh, uh, upper or top of the rod is 
decalcified or demineralized by our acid. So the major element in uh, having a, a marginal deterioration is because we are not overlapping our restoration on the top of our rods. So this is one of the causes. You see, this picture is almost all the time showed in the lectures and even in publication. This is the top of the rod. So your composite should lie on the top, not on the lateral surface of your rod. And so your composite should at least touch the upper part of your rods when you are cutting your preparation. And therefore, do not prepare your uh, tooth for composite the same way that you prepare it for amalgam. And at the top of your enamel, you have to cut it straight or even try to be a, a divergent towards the upper side of your tooth because the rods of the enamel are uh, perpendicular to the junction of the enamelodentin uh, uh, junction. So as you can see, your preparation is excellent. Yet, if you look in the microscope, you can see that the margins are not soft enough. So you have in your preparation, you have to soften the margins before you start your composite restoration. This is one of the major elements because the shrinkage of the composite will destroy the small rods that are not uh, regularly cut. And then at this level, you will start your uh, marginal deterioration. So your preparation is essential. As a solution, you have to understand the direction of your rods in every single point of your preparation. For example, for a class five, you can see, or a class two, you can see the direction of the rods. At the cervical margin, they are not horizontal. They are directed towards the gingiva. On the upper part of the cusp, they are at the, uh, in a different direction towards the occlusal side. And when you cut the occlusal uh, surface, you will have rods that are directed uh, towards the inner part of the preparation. So if you wanna do a, a, a preparation the same way we do it for amalgam, for composite, you will have always a problem in bonding the external margin of your uh, restoration. Knowledge is very important in this issue. So you see in green, this is the way I should cut my preparation to follow a little bit our uh, rods. And yet, of course, you can do some bevel to overlap your composite on the top of your rods, of your enamel rods. So you can see in a microscopy, the direction of the rods on enamel, they are totally different from the direction of the uh, dentinal tubules. Now, when you cut for amalgam, this is the way that we usually cut for amalgam. This is helpful in some way or another, but you have to look at the cavo-superficial angles, the mesiobuccal angle is not properly cut for composite, while the mesiopalatal angle is acceptable. Yet you have to look also in this picture, the presence of the enamel on the cervical margin. And if you have these margins uh, closed with enamel, then you have to cut them with a direction towards the gingiva. While if you look at the picture on your right, we have intended to place the wooden wedge just to show you the cervical margin. It's so deep, we don't have enough enamel on the cervical margin. Trust me, this situation is so difficult to bond on the cervical margin, while when you have enamel, the uh, uh, outcome of your restoration will last, of course, longer than the restoration of the uh, right side. And if you look an, uh, at an x-ray, you can see easily the presence of the enamel. Should we leave this enamel? We don't have the right to leave unsupported enamels. And that's
That's why if you leave these unsupported enamels, you might fail, like with the right side, a fracture of the enamel and then infiltration again of the bacteria and have a recurrent decay. How would you do this? You have multiple techniques. The easiest way is to use an ultrasonic insert that can help you to cut the cervical margin of the enamel, try to cut the excess of enamel that is not supported without harming the adjacent tooth. Also, fracture in the uh, cusps could occur, and this might be caused by a thin cusp that we didn't evaluate it right. We didn't support, suppose that it might fracture, Yet the shrinkage of the composite and the stress of the composite could fracture the enamel. And you can see easily within these images, the failures in the cusps, whether it is vertical or even horizontal, not only on the cervical margin of the cusp, but also it might occur on the occlusal surface. These are supposed to be unsupported enamel. Now you have the shrinkage of the enamel and the bonding in our days is very efficient. That might goes up to 20 megapascal. So this 20 megapascal could be so uh, harmful for uh, the enamel, yet the dentin is too elastic and it can support this flexibility and uh, uh, it can support the enamel in a way or another. So the most important to understand the reason behind is what we call the c factor which is the unbonded uh, surfaces to unbonded surfaces if you want to go deeper it is the percentage even of the bonded surfaces to unbonded to the percentage percentage of unbonded uh, surfaces and you know that the shrinkage of the composite goes towards the center of the composite as usual it's not toward the light and therefore you might cause if you are bonding to too many surfaces, especially if you are bonding to two uh, antagonist surfaces, you might, or you might uh, create a lot of stress and create uh, that uh, type of a fracture. And in my opinion, even if you are using uh, bulk fill uh, composite uh, material, uh, stress is always there. Maybe it's a little bit less but if you still have unsupported enamel, even with bulk fill material, in my opinion, and I will show you a case where we had a fracture at the margins, at the cervical margin of the cusp. Now to prevent such a uh, problem, when you have a thin uh, cusp, it was stated in the literature that you need only to cut 1.5 millimeter from the top of your cusp and then you are on the safe side. Look at this failure inside the cusp and it's so difficult to see it in the eye. You have to look in your uh, loop or microscopes to, uh, to uh, observe. This is what we call observing the problem uh, that comes behind a certain sensitivity for the patient when he's chewing. So you cut the cusp at least 1.5 millimeter. And the more you have a thin cusp, the more you have to lower the, uh, your cusp. As a recommendation from the beginning, we can start by always support your enamel with dentin. And while rest uh, restoring, start to reinforce thin layer in case you have small or thin layer. Try to do your cusp built up before you continue, yet do not go always with the uh, transformation uh, from class two to class one if you have a big restoration to do, although it is somehow uh, recommended and we will discuss it. The first layer of composite should be as thin as possible so that the stress will not cause too much fracture in your hybrid layer and you try to do some progressive light curing uh, to let the stress go slowly within your material. And it is recommended, but uh, sometimes it's not easy to polish after a certain time. It is preferred after 24 hours so that the stress inside your material will be relieved. Contact points, how to solve them. 
as usual, we have a lot of techniques to uh, restore our uh, uh, class two uh, uh, restorations or preparations. You have uh, uh, the um, partial matrix as well as the Toffelmeyer matrix or whatever type of matrix you would like to use. It's uh, for me um, a simple case. We are considering to be a simple, ca it's simple case because the partial matrix will help you to have a, a convex profile, which is very acceptable, uh, these ones. Such uh, ring was the old version. Now we are using uh, rings that can fit in the embrasures and even they have a V shape in the cervical margin. So it can fit also on uh, top of your wooden wedge, which is much more comfortable for you to handle and to uh, uh, cervically uh, close the gap and all around your uh, transitional lines. The matrix should be as thin as possible. I recommend and I practically use the 0.33 millimeter. So your wooden wedge uh, should be placed at the right uh, zone, which should be uh, in between your cervical margin, the two cervical margin and the matrix. So what you see here is the wrong placement of your wooden wedge. And of course, it should be underneath. These are simple situations, but you have to uh, uh, always be sure that you are closing well your margins. So. If you want to do a good uh, cervic, uh, cervical application and a good contact point, like for example, this picture don't have a good contact point, or maybe we have lost our contact point because of the periodontal problem, you will have to uh, find the problem first. Let's say it's a perio problem. So you have to, uh, uh, you have to tell your patient that this problem might occur after a certain time, even though you will solve the problem immediately. I mean, even you, if you try to close the po contact point again, and that the periodontal problem is still there for the, uh, for the second molar, especially, and that the patient, uh, while eating, uh, the, the tooth will uh, be a little bit, uh, mobile so it will uh, move a little bit towards the distal side it will open the contacts again and so the patient will come back to you asking you why this uh, had happened do you have to explain to your patient that this uh, uh, problem might occur again if you are still having periodontal problems so what you have to do in this case you have to pre-wedge your, uh, 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 your teeth, your, your, let's say the second uh, tooth that you are going to restore, you have to pre-wedge it. You can see easily that by pre-wedging uh, both teeth that we have a larger uh, a gap between both teeth. So I prefer to place my wooden wedge before I start cutting my teeth in a way that I will take the maximum gap between these both molars. And when I restore my teeth again, then I will have a long lasting uh, contact point, um, even though we have uh, uh, some kind of uh, periodontal problem for the patient. So this is one of the solutions that we are almost all using. And uh, of course, you know that composite is not like amalgam, it's not a compactable uh, material. So you have to, and I do it uh, all the time when I restore my uh, class two uh, with composite uh, preparations, I have to push all the time on my contact point during the light curing uh, time. When you want to light cure your composite, you have to push your matrix towards the contact point of the adjacent tooth. As always, you have to do this. And I'm always doing this. This is not amalgam, it's a composite and it doesn't have any pressure on the matrix. So you have multiple techniques if you like to use them. The easiest way is to use whatever type of material a, 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 a burnisher could help or even if you like to buy whatever uh, um, instrument. And so if you have a small cavity, 
you have the right, in my opinion, and with the opinion of a lot of uh, researchers, that you have the right to close the uh, contact point at the beginning, be sure that you have a good contact point, and then you try to fill the cavity like if it's a class one cavity. Now, this can be done for uh, small cavities, and yet you have to take care about the C factor. But for large cavities, you have to take care even though you are using bulk fill materials. Don't trust that much bulk fill materials, in my opinion. Uh, remember, they all have some kind of stress inside them for a certain time. So contact points is not easy to do. To do it, you have two possibilities. First of all, pre-wedge and then cut your preparation and then start to uh, uh, create your uh, uh, contact point and close uh, class two into class one and fill in the cap to finalize your uh, restoration. If you don't have adjacent teeth, just to be sure that you are closing well your matrix, especially on the cervical margin, and that was reported in all the books, try to close with a wooden wedge or whatever wedge you can create or you can model inside the patient of the mouse. Do not trust uh, the closure of the matrix. Saliva would pass through and under microscopes, we saw, we, we, it was clear that the infiltration of saliva comes in and when you have saliva on the margins of your restoration, uh, your restoration is dead. So always close the gap, even if it is too large. This is a very simple wood that I have modeled and you can place it. And so you have uh, the closure of the margin. You are much more secured. So as a recommendation, we start by pre-wedging. If you have a problem in your contact point, you can use a pre-shaped and thin matrixes because it helps you to have a, a nice profile also. And if they are so thin, so you can, uh, uh, they, they can help you to compensate the pre-wedging, uh, uh, the thickness uh, of the matrix. Try to burnish well your matrix. And if you like, you can even burnish your matrix before placing it in, your, in the mouth of the patient. Apply your condenser 100% of my restorations. I apply my condenser, whatever my instrument you have, while curing your uh, composite restoration. You have the right for some restorations to transform it from class two to class one. So this is the second set of recommendations that we can use to solve some of our problems, yet we have to understand them before we try to solve them. Now, bonding to dentin is one of the major uh, problems that all the researchers are working on for a long time ago. We have problem on the margins if you don't have enamel, and there are also problems when you have deep uh, preparation. Now, both problems occurs are uh, uh, um, comes from uh, uh, sensitivity, the patient comes back with a certain sensitivity. You have to uh, understand well the difference between two types of sensitivities. There are the first one, which is the hypersensitivity. If this sensitivity comes from, let's say the patient tells you that I'm having sensitivity because when I'm eating, let's say sugar, or maybe when I'm uh, maybe drinking some water, while if the patient is having sensitivity when he is chewing on his composite, then there is a totally different uh, problem. And the problem that occurs because of chewing is called the post-operative sensitivity, while the sensitivity that comes from the, let's say the stress over your cusps or maybe the uh, stress uh, on the hybrid layer that was fractured and then the margins of your uh, box was uh, opened due to the stress of your composite. So uh, sugar can infiltrate easily. This could be, this could happen and we can call it all uh, the hypersensitivity or sensitivity due to uh, sugar and water, uh, cold water. Now, how to test Post-operative sensitivity, which is most important for us because we are talking about bonding to dentin, you just apply your burnisher in the center of your composite for about three seconds and you push and quickly you 
take out your burnisher from the restoration, the patient will feel the pain and the sensitivity uh, exactly when you, you, when you stop uh, pressing on your composite. This is what we call the post-operative sensitivity. And this is the way how we test our post-operative uh, post sensitivity. Now you have to differentiate it between uh, a failure or fracture of the cusp and post-operative sensitivity due to uh, weak bonding on um, dentin. To know if there is a fracture or failure in your composite or in your cusp, you have to uh, let your patient shoe or maybe shoe on a cotton roll, uh, try to do some lateral movements. And so he can be sure that he is, if there's any sensitivity during his lateral movement, we can be much more sure that this, is, that this should be a failure in the cusp. Main causes of uh, difficulty to bond to dentin is the presence of water inside the, your dentin. And of course, it's totally different from enamel because enamel has only 4% of water, while in dentin we have much more uh, water, up to 20%. And uh, practically, this water comes from the pulp inside the tubules. And you can see a lot, 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 lot of uh, publications showing you on TAM microscopes uh, uh, the, 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 the embedding of some of the water inside the uh, bonding. And this would cause failure uh, even at microscopic uh, level. So bonding on uh, dentin is not that simple as it is for uh, enamel. And so the post-operative sensitivity could occur because of the problem of this layer of bonding. Uh, it could start because you haven't isolated well your uh, preparation. So isolating with the rubber dam is essential. Also disinfection is essential because bacteria could be uh, infiltrating inside the tubules and it uh, creates some more uh, destruction of the collagen fibers and also to your hybrid layer. And so you will have again an open uh, uh, margins and then you will have a recurrent decay. So you will have again some sensitivity. And uh, if you, uh, so you have to disinfect, we prefer chlorexidine. Now you can choose whatever you like. Remember that a deep dentin, bonding to deep dentin is a little bit different from bonding to superficial dentin. And here comes the way how to prepare your dentin. You know that at a deeper dentin level, you have a lot of tubules. It can go up to 45,000 uh, tubules per millimeter square, while on the upper or maybe the superficial layer of your dentin, the number of tubules decreases up to 15,000 per millimeter square. So there is a difference in the bonding. And for having a good bonding, you should have one a, a hybrid layer. I mean, your bonding should infiltrate in between the collagen fibers. And second, your bonding should go inside tubules, which means it should uh, infiltrate the tubules. That's why in between, in the intertubular dentin, when we have much more spaces, you have a better hybrid layer than in a deep dentin, which means that you have a better bonding on the surface superficial layer of a dentin than on the uh, deepest part of your dentin. Now, more than this, you have to understand also the direction of the tubules. The same way I was, as I was saying about the enamel, the direction of the roads is very important. Also, the direction of the tubules is very important. And therefore, for a class two restoration, when you have uh, uh, the cervical margin of your uh, uh, boxes, uh, the dentin is not vertical, they are lying, uh, lay, laying uh, horizontally, excuse me, laying horizontally, as I can see, uh, as you can see in the picture, different direction are shown in this image, horizontally uh, laying the, the, the tubules. So you are bonding on your lateral tubule. It's not like when you are infiltrating in between the uh, tubules and, and the, and the intertubular dentin. Also, in some places you have like sclerotic dentin, so you have closure of the tubules, much more calcified dentin, which is much more difficult to infiltrate and to create hybrid layer. Also in this picture, you can see it's a total uh, closure of the tubules and a lot of calcification in between. This is a very difficult situation to bond 
on while on normal dentin you have normally horizontal uh, vertical tubules and so it is open and it's the e this is the easiest place to bond to dentin and if you look clinically what you see practically you might see some black dentin which is infiltrated may be infiltrated by amalgam corrosions or a uh, brown if it's not decay, then it should be some tertiary dentin and tertiary, tertiary dentin is much more calcified and it's hard to bond to. Should you go to chemical bonding in this simple situation, this is what you have to, uh, what we will be uh, discussing maybe in the solution. Look at this case, for example, the whole pulpal surface is totally black. You do not know what type of a dentin you're working on but be sure that this, is, this type of a denting is uh, very hard to infiltrate. So you have to find a way to uh, solve your, uh, to, uh, to enhance your bonding. Should you go for chemical bonding, like for example, resin modified glass hyonomer, are you so close to the pulp so you have to uh, protect your pulp before placing your resin modified glass hyonomer? All of these should be uh, taken into consideration. Yet, look at this type of dentin. It's totally different from the, uh, the class one part of the preparation. So preparing your dentin the same way for both type of uh, dentin is not logic. You're not gonna uh, place your bonding the same way on both type of a tissue. You have to prepare this type of a tissue differently from the upper uh, the, the class one. So maybe I would close chemically the uh, uh, with the glass ionomer cement in the uh, difficult uh, uh, or highly calcified surface. And then I will go with a normal uh, bonding on all over the surface. Our objective, of course, is to infiltrate the hybrid layer. And if you leave your hybrid layer for a certain time, uh, your, your collagen fiber for a certain time, and you didn't prepare it well, you will lose this surface and all the collagen will collapse. That's why most of the companies are marketing what we call the self etch adhesives. And yet, uh, although they are uh, very well uh, accepted and the, their uh, uh, bonding uh, goes up to 13 megapascal, maybe up to sometimes 20 megapascal, still, the uh, three steps bonding system, which is called uh, and considered to be the gold standard is still having and getting and giving us much more bonding that can goes up to 25 megapascal. Remember that when you bond to dentin, your bonding is not 100% perfect and nobody in the world can create a 100% perfect bonding. There is always some places where you have a fracture in your hybrid layer. There's always some places, even your hybrid layer is completely destroyed or even a separation between your composite and your hybrid layer. This is possible. Now, all your, uh, uh, your uh, um, uh, treatment should follow the symptoms of the patient. Practically, we prefer to wait if the patient have some kind of hypersensitivity for a reason or another. Uh, yet with the new type of self-adhesive, uh, 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 self-etched adhesive uh, uh, universal systems, we are having uh, much less uh, uh, post-operative sensitivity. Yet when the patient have that much uh, hypersensitivity, you have to check for the problem and then you have the right to wait for 15 days. If the symptoms start to decrease, then you have the right to wait more until it decreases totally. And you have to write the right to wait up to two months. Two months if the patient is not that much suffering. And so the two months will help you to, uh, because uh, in, the, in the articles, everybody's stating that after two months, if there is any problem inside the pulp and the odontoblast, they will, uh, it will be reversible totally at the histological level after two months. That's why I wait for the clinical symptoms for 15 days. If everything is okay, I have the right to go a little bit far and just to check whether the vitality of the pulp is okay within the two months. Now, if you etch your dentin with phosphoric acid, 
which is not actually recommended. And I can show you on this photo that I have done on my microscopes, you can see that the acid, which is in blue, has infiltrated that much inside the tubers and opened too much our tubers. And such infiltration is not acceptable in our days. We do not need that much infiltration. And look what happens if you use your bonding that I have colored. And after etching the dentin at a deep, uh, deep dent in a deep uh, dentin preparation, you can see the infiltration of the resin inside the tubules is so far than what we were predicting. And this is very harmful for our pulp. So when you are facing a deep dentin, do not use phosphoric acid at all. You have the right, and which I do not recommend for the moment, to use it if you have a very superficial dentin because you don't know if you still have enamel or dentin on this surface. But for the moment, what we are heading is for the selective etch. I mean, you do not use the phosphoric acid on your dentin. You, whatever you use as a bonding, the three steps, two steps, or whatever one steps, remember that you have to understand the composition of your bonding, whether it is based on acetone or water or uh, alcohol. Remember that alcohol and water are easier to manipulate, while acetone is so uh, is little bit difficult and critical. So you have to be fast because acetone will evaporate faster than alcohol and water. So the infiltration within the you have much more time if you're not that much experienced. So better to use alcohol with uh, water uh, bonding systems. And uh, in when you have post-operative sensit sensitivity. I would recommend to go for the uh, changing your uh, bonding system towards the alcohol at the beginning. And then when you start to have much more, let's say we are all experienced, of course, but I had the same problem. So I had to change my uh, bonding system towards much easier one. And then I uh, enhanced my technique in a way that I can maybe use other uh, complex bonding systems. So at the end, Remember that the gold standard, what you can see here, which is the fourth generation that we are using three steps bonding systems. You have a hybrid layer, the HL is very thick hybrid layer. And this is the most important part of our bonding to dentin. The rest is just the infiltration inside the tubules. We just need some plugs. We do not need that much uh, tags that were uh, published long time ago. With the self-etch, uh, uh, we only have 1.2 microns of hybrid layer, less than the uh, fourth generation. And for the two, two steps, the hybrid layer is even less. So uh, the hybrid layer is decreased within the enhancement of our materials. It's true, but you have to know the structure of your dentin, the composition of your dentin, the situation, the clinical situation, whether you have uh, hypercalcified dentin or not. Now, if you have hypercalcified dentin, the self etch bond system, the universal or whatever you are using is not enough. Sometimes we are obliged to go for, uh, if you are uh, uh, sure what, of what you are doing to do a phosphoric acid for the self etch for the uh, uh, tertiary or hypercalcified dentin. So you have two techniques. You can do the selective etch. So I etch only the enamel, or maybe you have the right to do the total etch, whether it, it's up to you to uh, decide. I, for the moment, I'm doing almost more than 85% of my cases with the selective etch technique. So I'm not etching at all the dentin. I'm just etching my dentin with the acid that is embedded inside my bonding systems. So do not etch the dentin because the phosphoric acid is too aggressive. It will create some reaction from the pulp. And so you will have the, some enzymes and proteins that comes out from the pulp and they will destroy your collagen fibers, which means that they will destroy your hybrid layer. Do not etch your dentin with phosphoric acid. And then you continue normally by bonding and so on. Uh, remember that it is, uh, it is better to check for your, uh, um, I think I'm almost, uh, it's, it's four minus 10. 
Uh, Ziad, uh, can you hear me? I think uh, we are uh, at the end of my presentation. I will go fast a little bit here. So if you have deep cavities, it's, I will uh, explain for you something very interesting when you have deep cavities. When you are having deep cavities, there are two possibilities. The most important part is the biological space and the second part is your pulp. Now, so by the biological space, just to remind you a little bit, it should be around 2.04 millimeter from the level of the bone towards the junction of the enamel cement. Uh, let us suppose that you have two cases, as you can see on the left and on the right. The right uh, side of, uh, uh, I have my pointer again, okay. This side, I have, I still have a difficult uh, um, biological space or maybe the cavity is so deep, but we are not facing any problem with the pulp. While on the left tooth, the, uh, uh, the first molar, the decay has already uh, touched the pulp, so we have problems. That's why we had to do the uh, uh, pulp uh, uh, treatment, the endodontical treatment, of course. And then, uh, in a way or another, uh, we need, let's say we are uh, obliged in a certain way to do for the moment the uh, composite restoration, waiting maybe for the uh, full coverage of the tooth uh, or the crown, uh, depending on what happened, what, uh, especially in our days where we are not, uh, we don't have uh, the possibility to do, uh, to, to see our patients uh, every now and then. So maybe we can go, we can, um, we prefer to do some uh, composite restoration waiting for the full crown to be done. So we did the uh, endodontical treatment. And then after, as you can see, I have cleaned all the restoration. I'm trying to explain how we can do deep marginal elevation. The first of all, we have to restore the cervical margins of your uh, tooth. And so you're gonna place a very thick matrix. Remember what I'm saying, you place a very thick matrix. It's a hard matrix that can go inside your sulcus easily because it is thick, it will not bend easily. And then you will have to place a, 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 your wooden wedge. Placing your wooden wedge will not harm or affect the concavity of your matrix uh, or the convexity of your matrix because your matrix is so thick. Now you're gonna tell me that the matrix, a thick matrix will, my, will prevent of creating or recreating our contact point, which is normal. It doesn't matter for the moment. I'm not interested in the contact point for the moment. Now what I'm interested is in uh, adapting my matrix on the cervical margin of my tooth. So I will not have any infiltration of saliva or water or gingival fluid in my preparation. So I place my wooden wedge, I push as much as I can on my matrix. The matrix will have maybe a straight design and not a convex design. It doesn't matter for the moment because you are restoring this, the root part of your restoration. So, and then you will fill your composite, you do your preparation with um, self etch bond uh, uh, adhesives. Do not use acid on the cervical uh, uh, dentin, the most efficient uh, uh, bonding for the cervical margins because you don't have enamel at this level is the self etch bond. You have the right to fill it with uh, a flowable uh, bulk fill material if you like, or whatever flowable because it's easier to manipulate it at that depth. And then you go, uh, you go and restore this part of your tooth. So you are elevating your margins at a certain level. And then after you take out your matrix and your wooden wedge, you prepare again this phase of your tooth, but to know at which level you have to prepare it, you have to place again your wooden wedge and then you prepare the rest of your, uh, what you have added as composite. What is important here is that you have to be at the same level with your uh, wooden wedge. So don't worry to cut again until you reach your wooden wedge. This way you are sure that your wooden wedge will plug your matrix on your cervical margin. And then you continue your restoration like if it is a normal restoration. This is what we call it the deep elevation. And a lot of times we had to do it because we already have biological space enough because the bone was completely destroyed by our decay, not our decay, I mean by the decay. 
And so afterward, you can place your thin matrix, whatever matrix you like, and you reposition your uh, wooden wedge that will not affect your uh, matrix because it is supported, part of it supported by your uh, uh, composite and the other part is plugging or uh, uh, packing your, uh, plugging your uh, matrix uh, on your uh, prepared tooth and composite. And so this is the final result. It is normal to have in the deepest side, deepest part, a straight restoration, and then afterward the convexity start. As you can see, it's more visible on the second molar. It is straight on a certain point, and then comes the convexity, which is the normal uh, profile of a tooth. Of course, there are a specific matrix that you can use for if you like to have more convexity in these cases. So more, two things are very important for us, the deepest part of your uh, restoration and the biological space. Coming to the pulp exposure, let me just remind you that there are two possibilities of exposure, whether you have blood like this kind of exposure, or if you don't have blood, but you can see the pulp. This is considered for me and maybe for a lot of practitioners as an exposure for the pulp. The pulp, if you look at a scanning electron microscope, it's almost there. The endodontoblasts, when you cut them, they are almost sucked by your uh, uh, preparation. So you are touching almost directly your pulp, even in the pulp transparent situation. If you have large preparation, large opening, do not try to do a pulp uh, a capping. If it is small and that the patient is still young, maybe you have the possibility to do it. You have a lot of techniques. You can start by, this is the strategy in all, uh, what I prefer, we can go for, uh, if it is large, we can go immediately to uh, endodontical treatment. Otherwise we do some protection for the pulp, protect your, even your uh, calcium hydroxide, or if you are using biodentin, whatever you are using laser for pulp capping, you can choose whatever you like. And then you have the right to temporarily cement your, uh, your preparation for six months until you are sure on an x-ray that you have uh, enough dentin before you go in a second entry, or you can do a composite restoration immediately, but then you have to check all the time the pulp, whether it's okay or not. The vitality of the pulp is essential. If it's not, you go back to your endodontical treatment. If not, then you succeeded your uh, keeping your tooth vital. This is the strategy uh, globally what we, can, what we are using uh, in our university. There are a lot of thick, uh, materials. I will not discuss them now. We can maybe discuss them in the... Uh, so what we do, we have pulp transparency, go for uh, pulp capping. You can use the calcium hydroxide. You can use the biodentin. You can use whatever you like. And then you cover your uh, material if it is uh, calcium hydroxide with resin glass, enomer, uh, uh, modified glass, uh, enomer cements. One last thing that I would like to state, and uh, I think Dr. Ziad will be happy with this because uh, Franklin Tay is one of his friends. Uh, he stated long time ago, do not etch your pulp, do not place your composite straightforward on your pulp. This is uh, in my opinion, at least keep it in my opinion, and of course for the researchers, it's a disaster. There will be an inflammation inside the pulp, you will lose your pulp uh, uh, and it will degrade and will, and, uh, uh, bring some necrosis inside the pulp. Do not go further. Try to keep your pulp away of your restoration. This is normal. So as a conclusion, I can say that as long as the patient is applying a good hygiene and as long as the tooth is still vital, we can go for a composite restoration. Still, uh, if, as long also as still as you have enough heart tissue and especially the enamel especially the enamel. Remember, just I will give you some numbers. Bonding on enamel can go up to 40 uh, megapascal, at least uh, on uh, dentin is around uh, 15 to 25 megapascal. So if you have enamel, you are on the safe side. Large percentage of our restoration margins should be in enamel if it is possible. And finally, uh, you have nothing to lose in doing a good composite restoration if you have all of these elements, even if you have a, 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 a lot of destruction of the cusps due to bruxism. Do not be afraid to restore. You have nothing to lose.
and thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention uh, and i will uh, let you uh, stay safe at home the way i'm staying at home safe uh, i will be back to you ziad for the q and a if you have yes thank you very much dr nahas for this very informative uh, clinically oriented tips and tricks evidence based uh, presentation personally i have learned i always had a lot of <laughs> I find the answer there. I'm <laughs> sure that uh, the attendants also liked it, for sure. It means it's the, like the step-by-step -step going in the problem. And as you mentioned in your uh, title, it's solving the problem and offering some thoughts regarding that. Uh, yeah, no, Ziad, it's, unfortunately, it's almost impossible to go, uh, I think, deeper than this, or uh, we have already uh, passed our uh, time, uh, yet uh, there are still a lot of things to say, but, you know. Uh, yes, we have questions, you know, always. Mm -hmm. Good topics, good speaker, they have questions. Uh, sure. I'll try to uh, just uh, display the questions that I, find. you know, there is a lot of questions. So mm -hmm. one of the questions uh, were regarding how can I solve the problem of occlusally shifted contact while I'm sectional, I'm using a sectional matrix in restoring a class two? Occlusally shifted contact. Yes. Means that uh, the contact point of the occlusion is a little bit uh, uh, shifted because of the restoration or before they started? Probably of the tooth. It means the tooth has a shifted position. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to state something that we didn't uh, discuss here. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, full mouse restoration with composite. In another way, we have the right to restore the full surface, if you like, with composite, even if you are not preparing it. I mean, uh, let's say that you have uh, places where you have a contact point on your buckle side. If I understand, if, uh, if I understand the, the question, uh, I mean, the contact point is shifted, let's say, on the buckle side or maybe on the palatal side and maybe on the buckle side, they don't have that much contact points, if I understand the, the question. Mm -hmm. So in our days, we have the right, because you have enamel on all the uh, occlusal surface, you have the right to do a full restoration of the part that is not in contact and reconstruct the contact of the tooth to be equilibrated between the buckle and the palatal side with composite. Don't worry about it if you have enough space. If it is not that much enough, then you can maybe a little bit grind and keep another space, uh, enough space. Uh, uh, this technique is much more recommended than you can then going to uh, crowning the tooth to restore a normal occlusion all over the surface. You can uh, very simply add some composite, like I uh, give you another example. Yet it's not. Uh, an excellent solution, but it, this is one of the solutions that a lot of times we do it. You, when you have an old extraction of, let's say, the first molar and then the second molar is a little bit uh, uh, angled toward the mesial side, so you have the, let's say, the distal side is under occlusion, the mesial side is not an inclusion, but then you have a contact point with your premolar because the tooth has shifted a lot, to, a lot uh, towards the mesial side. So what we do, we reconstruct even the mesial side the mesial occlusal side of the tooth with composite, so to restore uh, and to level the occlusion on the mesial and distal, and you can do it even on uh, buccal and palatal. Thank Hope you. That I have, uh... Yes, thank you. While, uh, while preparing the bevel, what should be the angulation? And while preparing it, uh -huh. we will not be removing more tooth structure? That was the second question. Uh, of course, we are moving uh, structures uh, from the enamel when we are beveling, it's normal, but the advantage of having a bevel is more than if you are not doing a bevel in enamel. I mean, always in enamel. Now, the angulation uh, it changes depending, as I was saying in the preparation at the beginning, uh, the first uh, factor or the first uh, failure problem, depending on the direction of the enamel. Uh, if you are, for example, on uh, a second, which is much, uh, the, the most uh, difficult to, to evaluate is, let's say, the second molar, upper molar, uh, the, your preparation should be uh, uh, widely uh, uh, opened or diverged towards the occlusal side, 
uh, this is part like if you are beveling. Now, if you want to bevel that, say, the buckle side of your uh, class five, uh, the occlusal uh, margin, not the cervical margin, I prefer to have two angulations. The first angulation that is just near the preparation should be around 45 degree. And then after, if I want to make, let's say the, let's say the cavity is so large, let's say I need uh, about two millimeters of uh, bevel or maybe 1.5 millimeters. Half millimeter could be of 45 degree and the rest is 60 degree. I mean, you have to be so shallow, sh shallow in your uh, bevel. Uh, but the part that is near the preparation should be at 45 degrees. This will help to uh, uh, block the reflection of light and also to make the bevel, the thickness of the composite hard enough to support the stress of your uh, domestication. So double angulation, 45 and then 60. Thank you very much. And you can even do it uh, wavy, uh, in a wavy form. This is for aesthetic result. Uh, we're not talking about aesthetic. We have the light that will be, uh, uh, that will not reflect the line, right? Exactly, exactly. What about using another material under composite in deep cavity? Yeah. So uh, this is what we call, let's say, closed sandwich or open sandwich. The advantage is uh, to separate our uh, uh, pulp from uh, our restoration, especially in a deep uh, preparation. Now, what type of a material? I'm, I'm telling you, you can, there are a lot of materials that you can use, uh, uh, starting from the old type of material uh, that you combine it with the resin, uh, modified resin glass ionomer. The, re the modified resin glass ionomer, uh, based on uh, some of the researchers, uh, that there has uh, some embedded uh, resin inside it, so it can bond a little bit to the bonding system that you have, that you are using. Uh, you can use uh, biodentin, but then uh, the bonding on biodentin uh, is not the same as on resin glass uh, ionomer. It doesn't matter. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the concept is uh, just uh, behind. The, it, it is the concept is just you need to isolate. This is what we are looking for. You isolate your pulp as much as you can. Let's say that you don't have uh, an excellent margins and you're not sure that uh, your preparation will last for more than say for, let's say the predictability is about uh, seven years. So within the seven years, there will be some infiltration just to be sure that this infiltration will not go straight forward to the pulp. So you are uh, trying to help uh, in a way or another to uh, cover your pulp and keep it safe even after a certain infiltration. So use whatever you like to use. They are all, uh, they are not harmful to the pulp. Okay, thank you. The other question, can we use sodium hypochlorite instead of chlorexidine for irrigation of the cavity? Tricky question, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think the Japanese have uh, 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 published a lot of articles regarding this uh, situation. Uh, if you are um, uh, using uh, the old technique, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, total, etch, uh, total etch technique, I mean, the old technique by uh, uh, etching with phosphoric acid dentin, using uh, calcium, uh, using uh, sodium hypochlorite will uh, degrade, uh, will uh, cause a degradation in the collagen fibers, which I don't like because practically it destroys the um, organic part of the dentin. Uh, depends when you are using it. If you are using it before your uh, self etch uh, adhesive system, uh, not, the total, uh, not the total etch, uh, uh, I would prefer not to use it. Uh, I prefer to use chlorexidine much more. Uh, it's safer for my dentin. It's not, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the bacteria. The bacteria in all cases, we are supposing to uh, cut it in a first, uh, at the beginning, you can uh, disinfect it uh, with chlorexidine uh, as much as with uh, uh, sodium hypochlorite. So I prefer chlorexidine. Now, uh, 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 there has been some researchers the, who, who stated that uh, if you want to uh, 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 inhibit, inhibitate the MMPs to come back and destroy the collagen fibers, you have to clean it with 20% uh, uh, chlorexidine, which is uh, not always, um, uh, uh, we cannot find it in the market uh, all the time. 
That's why we prefer not to etch the dentin. So uh, the objective is to uh, preserve your dentin to have that uh, much. I prefer not, uh, I prefer the chlorhexidine, uh, chlorhexidine, not the sodium hypochlorite. There is one question, but I think you have answered it, is regarding the after placing your composite and the patient is feeling pain during eating, but nothing for a root canal treatment, and there is no high occlusal point. I think you have answered that while you were uh, lecturing, technically. Yeah, it's uh, the post-operative sensitivity, I suppose, because it's uh, during chewing. Uh, yes. It's post-operative. But, you, but uh, what, uh, remember that you have to check, not only for the post-operative sensitivity, check also if there is any failure in a cusp. You can ask your patient to chew on, uh, uh, let's say, cotton rolls, or if you have the insert of the inlay uh, in, uh, instrument that can help you also to uh, move your cusps uh, and check whether there is a failure. So it's not only postoperative sensitivity. Thank you very much. Another question for deep preparation close to the pulp. What would be your recommended protocol? Okay, uh, close to the pulp. Uh, first of all, the most important part is to really diagnose the situation of your pulp. And to diagnose the situation of the pulp, you s it starts by asking questions to your patient. Whether the pulp is in uh, good health, you have to uh, check whether the patient is uh, having pain uh, spontaneously and so uh, during the night or not. Uh, these are the major elements. Trust me, this is the major element. And then after, uh, if you like to test your pulp, you know that uh, we can test it with um, whatever cold, uh, even if you like heat. And there is, uh, uh, if you can, if you, if you have the opportunity to use the Doppler system, it's a little bit uh, costly, but it, uh, it's very efficient in uh, checking the flow, ability, uh, the flow uh, metric uh, of the blood inside the uh, pulp chamber. This is the, one of the most uh, advanced technique to check whether the pulp is in good, good condition. Now, if it is in a good condition, this is a major element for me. If it is in a good condition, condition you can do, uh, first of all, uh, we've been working on uh, disinfecting with laser. We've been working on disinfecting with uh, chlorhexidine, of course, uh, some of the, our research that have been done on uh, lasers also, the erbium YAG and erbium chromium. And you know, Zia, that we've been uh, conducting this uh, about four years ago, uh, we've been working on this. Uh, and then you have to isolate. Now, the protocol that I prefer to use are two, and this depends on the situation, the clinical situation. Uh, I'm sorry to say, but this is the only material, it's MT, modified MTA, which is the biodentin. I'm sorry, but I have to state this. This is the only material that's in the market, so I'm not uh, marketing anything, Yanni. And then uh, if you don't have in your hands, you can put, you have to place, uh, if you want a calcium hydroxide uh, over the uh, uh, deepest part that is maybe transparent uh, from the pulp, the transparent part of the pulp, you have to close it with calcium hydroxide and then place a patch around your calcium hydroxide. I mean, place a resin modified glass enamel, not only on the calcium hydroxide, but you have to place it even around the calcium hydroxide. Now, the critical point is that if you don't place right your calcium hydroxide, you will have a direct contact of your resin modified glass enamel that is a little bit acidic at the beginning with the transparent part or the tubules or maybe your pulp. And this is harmful for your pulp if you go back to some researches. So I prefer to be sure uh, of placing this protocol, otherwise go for the biodentin. Uh, Dr. Nahas, thank you very much for the very informative lecture. Thank you very much to all the attendants that were with us today. Thank you very much, Edik Dubai, for this very nice uh, web-based uh, education uh, for everyone, sharing this uh, beautiful scientific while again we are into this crisis and uh, hopefully to see you very, very, very soon.